It's a wonderful and glorious day, and a perfect day to learn more about electrochemistry. In this video, I'm going to continue teaching you about that, beginning with how to balance redox reaction equations. Are you excited? I know I am. Let's get started. So, anytime something gets oxidized, something else always has to be reduced. Although these processes occur simultaneously, or more or less so, in a redox reaction, it's often convenient to consider the individual oxidations and reductions as separate processes, just so you can see more clearly what's really going on. Take, for example, this redox reaction. If we look at this closely, you'll notice that tin is going from having a 2 plus charge to a 4 plus charge. That is, it's becoming more positive, which means it's losing electrons, so tin is getting oxidized. Iron, in contrast, is going from 3 plus to 2 plus, which means that it is gaining electrons. It's becoming more negative, which means that it is being reduced. So we can actually split this uh, overall redox reaction into two different reactions, one that shows the oxidation of tin and the other that shows the reduction of iron. How would we do that? Well, we begin by just separating out them like this. In the oxidation step, we've got tin 2 plus turning to tin 4 plus. To balance that charge-wise, we have to put two electrons on the right side. In effect, this shows that what's occurring is each atom of tin is giving off two molar equivalents of electrons. Where do those electrons go? That's right, they go into the reduction reaction, where I've got iron 3 plus being transformed into iron 2 plus. These two electrons from the oxidation have to feed into the two electrons of the reduction. In order to balance everything out charge-wise, I have to put twos in front of both irons. Now, please notice that we show electrons as products in the oxidation step and as reactants in the reduction step. Equations that show the oxidation and reduction steps as being separate are called half reactions. I realize this might seem a little bit overwhelming, but please rest assured I'll show you a bunch of examples by the time we're done. So this will be as easy as knowing your own name. Now, there are actually two processes we go through in order to devise and balance half reactions for oxidation reductions. One is for acidic reactions and the other is for basic reactions. For redox reactions under acidic conditions, we follow these steps. First, divide the original redox reaction into two half reactions, like I just showed you. One for oxidation and the other for reduction. Second, balance each half reaction by doing the following in this order. A, balance elements other than hydrogen and oxygen. B, balance oxygen atoms by adding water wherever you have to. C, balance hydrogen atoms by adding H plus as needed. And D, balance charges by adding electrons where you need it. Third, multiply your half reactions by adding integers as needed to make the number of electrons lost in the oxidation equal to the number of electrons gained in the reduction. Fourth, add the half reactions together. Where possible, cancel out species that are the same on both sides of the final equation. And fifth, finish off by making sure that the atoms and charges are all balanced in your final balanced equation. So you may be super confused, but please let me show you an example. I want you to complete and balance this equation by using the method of half reactions. This equation, you should note, is under acidic conditions. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do that in this video, but please click the link here to a separate one in which I show you how to do this, because it's crucial to see to be able to understand. Okay, now that you've watched that, or at least I hope you've watched that, here's another one. Blank electrons appear in the following half reaction when it is balanced. Now, having shown you how to do this kind of thing in the previous example, I'm not going to solve this for you here, but we'll invite you to do it on your own. For students who take this class from me, well, you'll have to actually come to class and ask me how to do it. I'll be happy to show you there. Here's another one. The balanced half reaction in which chlorine gas is reduced to aqueous chloride ion is a blank process. Same kind of approach will be applied here. I'll let you guys do it on your own, and for students who take this from me, I'll show you in class. Here's a slightly easier one. What is the coefficient of the permanganate ion when the following equation is balanced? What the heck? I figure I'll go ahead and solve this one for you. You can click on the link here to a separate video in which I show you how to do it on the board. It's nice to see a teacher work out one of these every once in a while. And lastly, this one. What is the coefficient of the dichromate ion when the following equation is balanced? Similar to the previous one. If any of you guys are taking this class from me and want to see it, you can come to class. All right, now I promised you that there are two different ways of doing this, one under acidic conditions and the other under basic conditions. Now, if a reaction occurs under basic solution, we have to follow these steps, which are slightly different. First, 
follow steps one through three for balancing a redox reaction under acidic conditions. So those steps are pretty much exactly the same. Second, for any of your half reactions that have an H plus somewhere, add the same number of OH minuses to both sides of the equation as you have H pluses. Third, on any sides of the equations from step two, where there are both H pluses and OH minuses present, just replace them or combine them together to turn them into H2Os. And fourth, add your final half reactions together, canceling out species that are the same on both sides of the final equation and making sure that the atoms and all charges are balanced. All right, make sense? Yeah, maybe. Let's take a look at an example. I want you to complete and balance the equation for redox reaction that takes place here under basic conditions. Now, of course, I don't expect at this point to be able to do it on your own. Rest assured, I'll do it for you. You can click the link here to a separate video, which I'll show you how to do it on the board. But please watch it and pay attention how, to how it's done, because the next slew of questions I'm going to require you to do on your own, starting with this one. The balanced half reaction in which the dichromate ion is reduced to chromium metal is a blank process. Okay, I guess that's pretty much it for now. Now, you might remember at the beginning of this video, or the previous video, or one of the videos, I promised you that I would teach you guys in this chapter how batteries work. Now that we've thoroughly reviewed redox reactions, I actually can. So when the reactants in a redox reaction are separated into two different chambers, and the electrons are allowed to pass through a wire from one chamber into another, as the reaction occurs, it's called a voltaic cell, also known as a galvanic cell or a battery. The flow of electrons is called an electric current. The chamber where oxidation is occurring, this is the side that contains the reductant, the thing that gives up electrons to get oxidized, is called the anode. The chamber where reduction is occurring, this is the side that contains the oxidant, the thing that receives electrons to get reduced, is called the cathode. One way to remember that an anode occurs at the site of oxidation is that the words anode and oxidation both start with vowels, while cathode and reduction both start with consonants at least in English anyway. So here is a classic redox reaction from our book. As you'll note, zinc goes from being zinc zero to zinc two plus. It's becoming more positive going from left to right, which means that it's losing electrons, which means that it is getting oxidized. In contrast, copper is going from copper two plus to copper zero. It's becoming more negative, which means that it's receiving electrons, which means that it is getting reduced. We can actually separate this reaction into two half reactions as shown here. At the oxidation or anode site, the zinc is getting oxidized to become zinc 2 plus and spinning out two electrons. Those two electrons in turn get received by the copper 2 plus to reduce it from copper 2 plus to copper 0. This is this classic redox reaction. Now if we take this kind of setup and once again separate out the uh, zinc from the copper 2 plus and connect them together with a wire in some fashion, we get a battery. Here's how that actually looks. You've got a big rod of zinc connected by a wire over here to another rod that is coated in copper zero. And it's very important to notice that inside this container, we've got a bunch of copper two plus ions floating around. Because copper two plus energetically wants to receive electrons more than zinc zero wants to hang on to them, zinc zero passes its electrons through this wire and down into this rod. As we electrify this rod, those electrons are then absorbed by the copper 2 plus, which turns the copper 2 plus into copper zero. Copper 2 plus gets reduced while zinc gets oxidized. As zinc zero turns into zinc 2 plus, it of course begins to fill this solution with those zinc 2 plus ions. This current or flow of electrons going through this wire really is a battery. For example, if you took this current and had it run into an appliance or some kind of device, and then come back out, that flow of electrons would power that device. And that's how a battery really works. It's a redox reaction where the oxidation and the reduction uh, half reactions are separated into two separate chambers that are connected with a wire. Now, you might notice as you look at this diagram more closely that there's this strange thing called a salt bridge right here that has nitrate ions and sodium ions in them. What in the world is a salt bridge? What is it for? Well, let me explain. If your reaction were allowed to just move forward unaided, then a positive charge would gradually build up at the anode where zinc gets oxidized from zinc zero to zinc two plus. Similar issues in reverse would occur at the cathode, thereby leaving an unbalanced charge in each chamber. In reality, this unbalanced charge would ultimately halt the flow of electrons. 
Going back then to our figure, you can imagine once again that as the electrons get sucked out of the zinc zero, turning it into zinc two plus, and then going into the solution to convert copper two plus into copper zero, you'd eventually get a huge buildup of zinc two plus in this solution. That would result in a very large net positive charge building up. At some point, having an imbalance of charge, too much positive over here and not enough over here, stops the flow of electrons and kills your battery. The purpose of the salt bridge is to combat this. How? Well, salt bridge allows non-reacting ions, nitrate and sodium, in this particular case, to migrate one way or the other, whichever way is needed, just to keep the overall charge balanced between the cathode and the anode. This completes our circuit and allows electrical current to flow. Going back to our figure then, you can see that as we have a bunch of zinc positive charge building up, what can happen is this nitrate, which has a negative charge in the salt bridge, can just naturally flow in there to neutralize the overall building positive charge. Similarly, as we get a net minus charge over here at the anode, sodium cations can flow in there to balance out that minus charge. Keeping the charges balanced allows electrons to continue to flow from the anode to the cathode. If you didn't keep this charge balanced, then that electron flow would eventually cease and your battery would die. I think batteries are the most dramatic objects of all the objects. Because other things, they stop working or they break. But batteries, they die. Why aren't you using your Walkman? I can't. My batteries died in my lab this morning. The twins are gone. If you're a battery, you're either working or you're dead. I'd like to conclude now by reading Wikipedia's entry under lithium and lithium ion batteries, which is found at this HTML. It's pretty darn cool and I thought it would be interesting for you. Lithium is the metal with lowest density and with the greatest electrochemical potential and energy to weight ratio. So in theory, it would be an ideal material for batteries. Experimentation with lithium batteries began in 1912 under G.N. Lewis and in the 1970s, the first lithium batteries were sold. Three important develops marked the 1980s. In 1980, an American chemist, John B. Goodenough, disclosed the lithium cobalt oxide cathode, positive lead, and a French research scientist, Rashid Yassami, discovered the graphite anode, or negative lead. This led a research team managed by Akira Yoshimo of Asai Chemical, Japan, to build the first lithium ion battery prototype in 1985, a rechargeable and more stable version of the lithium battery, followed by Sony that commercialized the lithium ion battery in 1991. In 1997, the lithium-ion polymer battery was released. These batteries hold their electrolyte in a solid polymer composite instead of a liquid solvent, and the electrodes and separators are laminated to each other. The latter difference allows the battery to be encased in a flexible wrapping instead of a rigid metal casing, which means such batteries can be specifically shaped to fit a particular device. They also have a higher energy density than normal lithium ion batteries. These advantages have made it a choice battery for portable electronics such as mobile phones and personal digital assistants, <laughs> or PDAs, as they allow for more flexible and compact design. I read this only because I remember in the 1990s, and you may have seen this as well, that cell phones used to look like big old bricks. Cell phones, iPods, iPads, they're all tiny now. And what marked the ability of technology to allow them to become so small? Well, in large part, it was this development of the lithium ion battery. Furthermore, here are some additional links to information about some cutting edge battery research from Colorado State University, or CSU, where I happen to work as a postdoctoral fellow from 2010 to 2011. Links are shown at these HTMLs, which I'm gonna go to right now and read. Okay, I realize that this article is a little bit dated now, and I honestly don't know what updates have occurred since this article first came out. Nevertheless, I thought that it would be interesting to at least read it to you for two reasons. One is so that you can understand that research continues to go on in battery technology, and two, so that you can possibly get excited about it in case any of you guys are interested in a career in this field. According to this article, we read that the Prieto battery is the first startup produced by the business arm of Colorado State's new clean energy supercluster called Synergy. The technology was originally conceived by Amy Prieto, an assistant chemistry professor at Colorado State's College of Natural Sciences. Prieto battery aims to produce lithium ion batteries based on tinier nanostructured materials on mass scale. The article further states that Prieto, shown here in this picture, expects to demonstrate the first prototype of her battery by early next year. 
Using a process called electrodeposition, Prieto deposits or grows nanowires that make up the first key piece of the battery, the anode. She again uses electrodeposition to coat these tiny structures with polymers, organic materials, that conduct lithium ions but keep the anode and the cathode electrically separated. The nanowires that make up the anode cover a surface area that's 10,000 times greater than a traditional batteries. By comparison, roughly 1,000 nanowires could fit in the width of a human hair. This high number of three-dimensional wire creates a much larger surface area than any other current battery. The electrodeposition manufacturing method is fast and inexpensive, allowing the technology to be scaled up to create batteries that can be used for everything from pacemakers to automobiles. According to the CEO of this company, we believe Prieto Battery has created a process that will transform the electric hybrid vehicle marketplace. Not only will it create a much more powerful battery that can be charged in minutes rather than hours, but it can be manufactured at half the price of current battery technologies, thus opening the market to much broader group of consumers. Exciting? Yeah. Once again, I don't know exactly where this has gone since this article came out in 2009, but if any of you guys are interested in doing further research, I invite you to look into this a little bit more, because it could be very promising. That concludes this lecture video on electrochemistry. Please stay tuned to our next one, which will teach you more about batteries, redox reactions, and the glorious wonder of giving birth. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.